welcome to this episode of the weekly news roundup. In breaking news coming in from the United States, a sweeping foreign aid package easily passed the US Congress late on Tuesday after months of delay, clearing the way for billions of dollars in fresh Ukraine funding amid advances from Russia's invasion force and Kiev's shortages of military supplies. The Senate approved by 79 to 18 four bills passed by the House of Representatives on Saturday after House Republican leaders abruptly switched course last week and allowed a vote on the 95 billion US dollars in mostly military aid for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan and US partners in the Indo-Pacific. The four bills were combined into one package in the Senate, which President Joe Biden said he would sign into law. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said he was grateful to US lawmakers for approving vital aid for Ukraine. Zelensky said in a statement on the Telegram messaging app that this vote reinforces America's role as a beacon of democracy and leader of the free world. We bring you this report. The largest provides 61 billion US dollars in critically needed funding for Ukraine. A second provides $26 billion for Israel and humanitarian aid for civilians in conflict zones around the world. And a third mandates $8.12 billion to counter communist China in the Indo-Pacific. A fourth, which the House added to the package last week, includes a potential ban on the Chinese control social media app TikTok, measures for the transfer of seas, Russian assets to Ukraine and new sanctions on Iran. Biden's administration is already preparing a $1 billion US dollars military aid package for Ukraine, the first sourced from the bill, to US officials told Reuters. It includes vehicles, Stinger air defense munitions, additional ammunition for high-mobility artillery rocket systems, 155 million artillery ammunition, TOW and Javelin and deep tank munitions, and other weapons that can immediately be put to use on the battlefield. The Senate's Democratic and Republican leaders predicted that Congress had turned the corner in putting Russian President Vladimir Putin and other foreign adversaries on notice that Washington will continue supporting Ukraine and other foreign partners. The aid package could be the last approved for Ukraine until after the US elections in November. The influx of weapons should improve Kiev's chances of averting a major breakthrough in the east by Russian invaders. Also, it would have been more helpful if the aid had come closer to when Biden requested it last year, analysts said. It was not immediately clear how the money for Israel would affect the conflict in Gaza. Israel already receives billions of dollars in annual U.S. security assistance, but it more recently has faced its first direct attack by Iran. Aid supporters hope the humanitarian assistance will help Palestinians in Gaza, which has been devastated by Israel's campaign against Hamas to retaliate for the October 7th attacks that killed 1,200 people. Gaza Health authorities say the campaign has led to the deaths of more than 34,000 civilians in the Palestinian enclave. As we are all aware, the general elections in what is the biggest elections in the world are being held in India from the 19th of April to the 1st of June 2024. The elections will be held in seven phases to elect 543 members of the Lok Sabha. The votes will be counted and the results will be declared on the 4th of June. The general elections will be held over six weeks from the 19th of April to the 1st of June. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is hoping to win a third successive term, but opposition parties say Indians face the loss of many freedoms if he stays in power. Recent opinion polls suggest that the BJP and its allies will win the election for the Lok Sabha for a third time running. In the 2019 election, the BJP won 303 seats and the coalition of parties it is in, the National Democratic Alliance, took 352 seats overall. The main challenge in 2024 comes from a coalition of political parties headed by the Indian National Congress, the biggest opposition party. More than two dozen parties have joined in to form the Indian National Development Inclusive Alliance, India for short. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who completed a second term, is running for a third consecutive term. Although India has a multi-party system, two major parties, namely the Bharatiya Janata Party and the International Congress, dominate politics at the national level. 
The previous general election was held in April May 2019, after which the National Democratic Alliance, led by the Bharatiya Janata Party, formed the Union Government with Narendra Modi continuing as the Prime Minister. Article 83 of the Constitution of India requires elections to Lok Sabha to be held once every five years. The BJP has governed the country with Narendra Modi at the helm since 2014. The tenure of the 17th Lok Sabha is scheduled to end on 16 June 2024. In its manifesto, the Congress argues that unemployment remains high, especially for young people, and it promises increased welfare payments for women, 3 million extra government jobs and more apprenticeships for college leavers. It also promises that it will stop India's slide into autocracy. Minority groups say that they often face discrimination and attacks and have been forced to live as second-class citizens under Mr. Modi's rule, an allegation the BJP denies. During phase one of the polls, which took place on the 19th of April, in Bengal, Trinamool Congress and BJP workers clashed in Kush Bihar. In Manipur, a burst of gunfire was reported from a polling station. A polling station was vandalized in Imphal. The massive exercise to elect the 18th Lok Sabha has started with elections for 102 seats across 21 states and union territories. By the end of phase one, Around 60.03 percentage people voted. Sporadic violence was reported from Manipur and Bengal. The Congress, pushed out of much of North India, insists it is on the cusp of a comeback. Senior leader K.C. Venugopal has said that the party will post improved performance in most northern states, including the BJP bastions of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. With assembly poll victories in Telangana and Karnataka and the alliance with DMK in Tamil Nadu, the Congress party projects huge confidence about the results in the South. It's not clear who will lead the country if the opposition alliance called India wins the election. It's more than 20 parties have not put forward a candidate yet. Although India's economy is amongst the world's fastest growing, many of its people face growing economic distress. The opposition alliance is hoping to tap into this, seeking to galvanize voters on issues like high unemployment, inflation, corruption and low agricultural prices that have driven two years of farmers' protests. This election is seen as one of the most consequential in India's history and will test the limits of Narendra Modi's political dominance. If Narendra Modi wins, he'll be the second Indian leader to retain power for a third term after Jawaharlal Nehru, the country's first prime minister. Most polls predict a win for Modi and the BJP. In latest news coming in from Israel, the chief of Israeli military intelligence has resigned over the 7th October attack. The head of Israel's military intelligence, Major General Aharon Halivi, has resigned over the failures surrounding Hamas's unprecedented attack on 7th October, becoming the first senior figure to step down over his role in the deadliest assault in Israel's history. Major General Haliva wrote in his resignation letter, the intelligence directorate under my command did not live up to the task we were entrusted with. I have carried that black day with me ever since. Day after day, night after night, I will carry the horrible pain of the war with me forever. Amid continuing widespread public anger with the political and intelligence lapses, Major General Haliva called for a state commission of inquiry to investigate the failures as he announced he was stepping down. Major General Haliva is the first senior figure to step down over his role in the deadliest assault in Israel's history. Major General Haliva's resignation sets the stage for what is expected to be a further fallout from Israel's top security brass over Hamas's attack when militants breached border defenses and rampaged through Israeli communities unchallenged for hours and killed 1,200 people, mostly civilians, and took about 250 hostages. That attack set off the war against Hamas in Gaza, which is in its seventh month. The Israeli military said in the statement that Major General Haliva had asked to end his service following his leadership responsibility. Shortly after the war began, Major General Haliva had publicly said that, as a head of the military department responsible for providing the government and the military with intelligence warnings and daily alerts, he shouldered blame for not preventing the assault. 
The Israeli military said in a statement that military chief of staff Hersi Halevi accepted Major General Haliva's request to resign and thanked him for his service. Major General Haliva, as well as other military and security leaders, were widely expected to resign in response to the glaring failures that led up to the 7th October attack. Later on, the head of the IDF Central Command, Yehuda Foods, whose area of responsibility includes the occupied West Bank, also announced that he was stepping down in the summer. The timing of the resignations is unclear because Israel is still fighting Hamas in Gaza and battling the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah in the north. Tensions with Iran are also at a high following attacks between the two enemies. He will remain in the post until a successor is named. Israeli media and commentators expect further resignations once the main military campaign in Gaza wraps up. The October 7 attack badly tarnished the reputation of the Israeli military and intelligence services, previously seen as virtually unbeatable by armed Palestinian groups like Hamas. In the early hours of the morning of October 7, following an intense rocket barrage, thousands of fighters from Hamas and other groups broke through security barriers around Gaza, surprising Israeli forces and rampaging through communities in southern Israel. The Hamas attack, which came on a Jewish holiday, caught Israel and its wounded security establishment entirely off guard. Israeli sense of faith in their military, seen by most Jews as one of the country's most trustworthy institutions, was shattered in the face of Hamas' onslaught. Some 1,200 Israelis and foreigners were killed in the attack, most of them civilians, and around 250 were taken into captivity in Gaza where 133 remain as hostages, according to Israeli reports. Hamas' attack set off the devastating war that has killed more than 34,000 Palestinians in Gaza, according to the local health ministry. The ministry's count doesn't distinguish between combatants and non-combatants, but it says at least two-thirds of the dead are children and women. While Major General Haliva and others have accepted blame for failing to stop the attack, others have stopped short. Most notably, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, who has said he will answer tough questions about his role but has not acknowledged outright any responsibility for allowing the attack to happen. He has also refused to step down even as a growing protest movement demands early elections. Continuing public anger in Israel over the intelligence failings was underlined in new polling by the Israel Democracy Institute that suggests more than 62% of Israelis believe those responsible for the failures of 7th October should resign, while 51% support elections by the end of this year. From Israel, we move to a developing story from China where massive floods threaten millions of people in southern China. Multiple days of heavy rains have lashed southern China, unleashing deadly floods and threatening to upend the lives of tens of millions of people as rescuers rushed to evacuate residents trapped by rising waters. Guangdong province, an economic powerhouse, home to 127 million people, has seen widespread flooding that has forced more than 1,10,000 people to be relocated, state media reported, citing the local government. The floods have killed at least four people in Guangdong, including a rescue worker, state news agency Xinhua reported. At least 10 people remain missing, it added. Since April 16th, sustained torrential rains have pounded the Pearl River Delta, China's manufacturing heartland, and one of the country's most populated regions, with four weather stations in Guangdong registering record rainfall for April. The Pearl River Basin is subject to annual flooding from April to September, but the region has faced more intense rainstorms and severe floods in recent years, as scientists warn that a climate crisis will amplify extreme weather, making it deadlier and more frequent. Last year, China encountered more intense and extreme downpours during the flood season than in the previous years, with 72 national weather stations registering record daily rainfall and 346 stations breaking monthly records, according to China Meteorological Administration. Since last week, at least 44 rivers in the Pearl River Basin have swelled above the warning line, threatening to burst their banks, according to state broadcaster CCTV. 
On the Bay River, which flows into the Pearl River, authorities have warned of a once-in-a-century flood expected to reach 19 feet above the warning limit. The heavy downpours have also triggered landslides near Shaquan City in the province's mountainous north, injuring six people, according to Xinhua. Authorities raised the flood control emergency response for the Pearl River Delta to level 2, the second highest in a 40-year system. Many cities have suspended schools and hundreds of flights have been cancelled in the metropolises of Guangzhou and Shenzhen. Further heavy rainfall is expected to hit Guangdong according to the province's meteorological bureau. Footages from across Guangdong showed flooded villages, farmland and cities along with collapsed bridges and floating vehicles. In addition to the 1,10,000 people who have been evacuated, at least 25,000 are in emergency shelters. In the provincial capital, Guangzhou, authorities have registered cumulative rainfall of 609 mm in April so far, which is already the highest monthly volume since record-keeping began in 1959. A United Nations report released on Tuesday noted that Asia was the region hardest hit by climate change in 2023, with floods and storms at the top of the list of factors causing casualties and economic losses. Scientists warn of increasingly extreme weather conditions as climate change driven by human-emitted greenhouse gases makes extreme weather events more frequent and intense. China is the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. Thanks for watching. Until we meet next time, stay blessed.